marched into the shore of the promised land, and what did they say? The giants are too big. We are like grasshoppers. He's not powerful enough to bring us through. And brothers and sisters, that is the same thing we say in our hearts today. In our Sabbath school class, in the book Evangelism, there was a quote taken from the third to the last chapter, I believe, about the delay. Why is there a delay? And this is what I've been trying to bring to your mind, is for you as individuals to think, why has Jesus not come back yet? Did Jesus promise that I'll come back? Yes. Is he slack concerning his promises? No. Peter tells us no. So the question is, is why hasn't he come back? Is the promise or the lack of the fulfillment on the promise God's fault? No. If it's not God's fault, then whose fault is it? I want you to think about this. And I want you to ask yourself, what is it that you really want out of this life? Do you just want the material blessings that this world has to offer? Do you want peace? Do you want health? Do you want to go to your grave? Do you ever see a plethora of grandkids or great grandkids? What is it that you want out of this life? What I've come to understand and realize is that the majority of churches today are teaching people how to meet Christ through death. Through death. That you'll meet Christ after you die. That you'll have to go through the portals of the tomb to meet him. But do you realize that that's not all of God's plan? God's plan is to have a people that he can come back for. Yeah. A people who are alive. Not, not afraid. Not hiding. People who are alive and are imbued by the power of the Holy Spirit. And who are on fire for him. Amen. And are not afraid of anything that the world throws against them. Listen, what does the Bible say God's feelings are towards cowards? Have you, have you ever done a study on that? Paul makes a list of all those who won't be in God's kingdom. And you realize that that word is in there. What did you say, Ray? Fear. Fear and unbelief go hand in hand. The people, when they were brought into the promised land and they sent out the spies, how many spies did they send out? Whoa. And how many spies came back with good reports? Two. Two. So ten came back with a negative report. And what was the report that the negative was? That was there's giants in the land. Right? As we look to where we're at today, in the timetable of Earth's history, we're at that cusp. We're at the door. We're at the gates. I've asked you over and over again. You can ask people that aren't even biblically literate whether they believe that we're living in the last days of Earth's history, and you'll be surprised how many will tell you yes. From what I see, I can't see the world lasting too much longer. The world sees it, but yet God's people are living in unbelief and they're living in cowardice, and God doesn't like cowards. Do you know why God doesn't like a coward? Because God is not living in that coward's heart. You understand that? Because you cannot have that kind of fear, cowardly fear, where you don't think God is able to do what God says with God living inside of you. Does that make sense? So the question is, is why are we still here? Answer that personally, not corporately. Personally. In your own life, where is your faith? Does it ever strike you as amazing 
that when the disciples were in the boat, <coughs> the waves were crashing over, and they thought they were going to die, and they were so preoccupied with saving their lives and bailing out water and rowing that they forgot Jesus was there in front. What was Jesus doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. Now, who was afraid? All the disciples, right? And they were working. They were working to save their lives. What was Jesus doing? How did he have such peace? Because he had total dependence on his Father. And there was nothing that made him afraid. So listen, we're told that they're in the middle of the lake, the boat's about to sink, lightning flashes, and they finally see Jesus, and he's fast asleep. Fast asleep. Now, have you ever been on a fairly decent sized boat in rough weather? Now, I don't know how you ever sleep on something like that. Can you imagine being in a tiny boat in rough weather? But Jesus is asleep. Why? Because he put his entire life in God's hands. And that whatever happened, he knew was God's will. What's the difference between that thought and the Muslim's thought of Allah's will? If it be Allah's will, it's Allah's will. There is a difference. Do you know what the difference is? Here, let me ask you this question. There was a movie that came out probably five, six years ago. It's called Hidalgo. It's a movie about a horse. Anybody ever see that movie? Hidalgo. It's a movie about a little, did you see that movie? About an Arabian horse. An Arabian horse is there. They are a beautiful creature. And they are powerful and they are small and compact. But for crossing the desert, they're a perfect horse to have. Hidalgo, there was a race and it went across the desert. And this guy had this Arabian horse. And in the process of this race, he was meeting up with a lot of Muslims. And one man, his horse died, and he was about to kill him. And he says, well, it's Allah's will. And the, the guy from the West, who was a cowboy, he said, well, what about your own will? So there's three wills I'm talking about here. There's human self-will. There is the Muslim view of God's will, and then there's the Christian's view of God's will. Are they all the same? We know the answer to that is no. Is there a difference between the Muslim and the Christian's view of God's will? When you look at Jesus resting in this boat, what was the difference between his will and this guy who was about to give up because you know, it's Allah's will that I die, and I guess I'm going to die? Think about these questions. And the answer is, you have to know the true God. And when you put your faith totally in Him, when you have total dependence on God, the true God, the real God, then you understand that you are an ambassador for Him. And that everything you do is part of whatever plan He has for you. Was Paul as the apostle? Truly resting in God's will all of his life as an apostle? Not Saul, but Paul. Did Paul fully give his heart no matter what? So it didn't matter whether Paul was shipwrecked, floating in the ocean, whether he was chained in prison, whether he just got stoned and he would... whether he just was knocked out because the people stoned him. <laughs> Laying in the street. Did he believe... <laughs> no, he finally caught it, huh? Did he believe that whatever happened to him was part of God's will? Yes. Or was it truly God's will? So listen. Why are we cowardice? Why are we afraid to go through this end time? Why are we afraid to have total dependence on God? Because we don't believe that God will do what God has said. We don't believe that God is able to protect us. We don't believe that God will even protect us because we see all the evil in this world. We see how prevalent it is. And we don't see the strength of God in God's people. 
Why is it that we're able to see the power of evil so much stronger than we see the power of God? Should it be that way? Is that the way it's supposed to be? Is the problem with God? Problem with us? Why are we still here? Yes? I can't help but go to Joshua. Can you read that for us? Yes. The Lord had already told Joshua a couple times to be strong and take courage. But the last time in verse 9, he said, Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. It's a command of God that we need to take courage if we believe. A command. A command to be created. And that's not the only place in Scripture where you find God commanding His people to be courageous. Now listen, brothers and sisters, if you want to live in this world in the last days, you need to have courage. And you need to have courage in something that is not going to let you down. The reason why God will allow His people to go through this time of trouble is so that we will give up everything earthly that we depend on. Now listen, there's a lot of things we depend on. There's a lot of things we use as crutches that should be God, but is not. Do you realize that's a form of idolatry? And that's the great sin of the church today. As I close, I want you to look at one last text. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, let's look at verses 37 through 39. Why should we have courage? Why should we not be afraid? Why should we allow God to work out whatever His will for us in this life? Because what does verse 37 say? Ray, can you read that for me? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. What are we? More. <laughs> Listen, we are more than conquerors. What does that? What does that mean? What have we conquered? The world. With that, in Jesus Christ, there is nothing that can come against you that you can't overcome in the power of the Holy Spirit with Christ dwelling in you. Do you believe that? Amen. This is why we are told as God's people that before Christ comes, there has to be a special work amongst God's people, a work of putting away of sin. Amen. But we look at that and go, yeah, that's impossible. I listened to one, two, three, four, five, at least five sermons this week on the radio, and each one of these pastors we're preaching on victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. Uh, Charles Stanley, are you familiar with him? Okay? Charles Stanley. Victory in Jesus. Now the man said, there is no sin that you cannot overcome with Christ living in you. Chuck Swindoll, are you familiar with him? Chuck Swindoll this week said that we as God's people should not start our day thinking that we're going to be defeated, that sin's going to overtake us, but that we should realize the power that we have in Christ, that we are more than conquerors. Now listen to what they're preaching. And we as Seventh-day Adventists have been preaching this for 170, what, 172 years? And our people are saying, yeah, we'll never overcome sin. So we've stopped trying. But we are trying in our own strength. And you'll never gain victory that way. Let me ask you a question. For Jesus to come back, and for a people who is able to look at Him coming back, is He coming back as your mediator? Is he leaving the heavenly sanctuary where he mediates for your sins? Yes. So when he comes back the second time, does he put on a different robe? Yes. 
Does he take off his priestly garments? Not a priest anymore. What does he come back as? King, king of kings, lord of lords. Amen. If he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords, and it's not as a priest, then what's God's people going to be doing when it comes to sin? It means they're not going to be doing it, right? This is why you've got to have this relationship with Jesus Christ. Because it's only through His power and His indwelling in your hearts that you will gain this victory. But you've got to ask yourself, is it possible? Because this, brothers and sisters, is the giant that's in the land that we face today. And we look and say, we're just crickets. It's too big. It's too high. We can't do it. And yet, there were two. Out of the spies, there were two who said, we can do this. God is with us. There is nothing, nothing that can keep us from the promised land. Right? They didn't deny the report of the other ten, but their focus was different. That's what we're called to be. The same thing. The focus is with Christ. So as I stop this morning, we'll go back to this text, and I want this text to be with you all week long. All week long. Now listen, I picked that text specifically, but as I close this morning, I want to go up and start at verse 31. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, what? Listen, if God is for you, who can be against you? If God is for you, who can bring a charge against you that will stick? Nothing and nobody. Paul is laying out a course here, and he's setting a foundation, and he wants you to believe in this God. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for who? For us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We look at that and go, well, what I want is enough food, a good house, a really nice car, good money in my bank account. Is that what God's talking about here? Is that all the things He's freely given us? What is this verse talking about? What He's given us is spiritual. And He's given us life. And He's given us power. And He's given us victory. Amen. Jesus Christ. But listen, don't you love this God who says, if you seek Me with all of your heart, then all these other things will be added unto you. He will give you enough food to eat. He will give you a place to live. And if you need it, He'll give you a car to drive. The graciousness of our God. But what Paul wants you to understand is that, listen, you need to understand who you are in Christ. That you are more than conquerors and that nothing can separate you from God's love. Amen. So let's finish this and, and I swear I'll be done. <laughs> Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Verse 35, who shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What does it say? Shall tribulation, or what? Distress, or who you got to love this one? Or it keeps going. Famine. Nakedness. Peril. What's that last one? Sword. What does that mean? Death. What does Paul say? Can anything separate you from the love of God as it's found in Christ Jesus? This is why Jesus was able to sleep in front of that boat. Because he understood that he was secure in his Father. And brothers and sisters, you and I are secure in him. As long as we're in our closing here this morning is hymn number 524. <laughs>
bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that is contained in the scriptures. We thank you for the freedom and the privilege to be able to study these things. Father, help us to be worthy. Help us to be workmen that study your word, that know your word, that do not have to be ashamed as we go forth in this world to proclaim your word to a dying world. Father, I pray that you use us, that you will help us to finally realize that in Jesus, we have all the power we need to overcome anything that the world throws at us, to even overcome this own flesh. Father, strengthen us, convert us, use us. Help us to be that generation that sees Jesus come back in the clouds. Amen. For this I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.